we're going to finish up this afternoon with our communities and you. And so, um, just to look at numbers, and we don't want to, you know, bog you down with the numbers, but just the reality of it is, nationally, 60% of the adult population is a registered donor. That's a great thing. Um, if you look at North Carolina, 56.3% of North Carolinians are registered donors. They have a heart on their driver's license. That's a wonderful thing. We are the eighth largest registry in the nation. Um, we are concentrating on communities now. We're looking at these DMV numbers. We are looking at where do we need to target our awareness? Where do we need to target our education? And so you see here with um, the Caucasian and the African American rates, 67.9, 33.4%. We can do something. We can, we can raise these numbers. Another thing that's interesting that Taylor and I have found out is that that top line, you know, 60% of the adult population is a registered donor. They say that 95% of adults believe that donation is a good thing. So where's the discrepancy? How can we close that gap from thinking it's a good thing to actually registering? I found something very interesting um, back at Barack Obama when he was looking at these numbers and he was looking at the discrepancy and the um, number of people who weren't registered. He said in a speech, recognizing April as Donate Life Month is a great thing, but what we must do is our part to lift up donors, donor families, and patients by supporting efforts to shorten the organ waiting list. Together we can improve and save lives by celebrating those who give of themselves, whether as a living donor or a registered donor, to provide the greatest gift there is to ever offer. And I think he hit it right on the nail right on the head. We have to work together to raise awareness in our communities. We have to raise awareness and get more people registered. Now, our 2020 goals, and they're pretty lofty goals. Um, I think Taylor and I sweat every day looking at this. You think 1%, well, that's not a big number. But when you think about moving the registry, getting people to put a heart on the license, this is where it comes in, you know, it's so critical. But as the communications department, we closely monitor that DMV data that is provided to us in a monthly report. And we look at our area, our service area, and we look at the counties and the areas that we are in. Um, and so the setting of the lofty goal of 1% to increase total donor designation rate, and so that would be the 56.3%, we're gonna increase that by 1% this year in 2020 to 57.3%. Now, when I look at 1%, one's just, you know, a number. But one can mean so much when you talk about organ donation. One person saves eight lives. And so increasing this will save and heal more lives. We're also looking at the African-American um, donor designation rate. And we also want to increase that by 1%. So that's taking that 33.4% to 34.4%. And like I said, that's where we can come together and we can work on these goals. We can get in these communities. Like Susan said, we have to talk about organ donation. We have to talk about tissue donation. We have to talk about registering. Now, here you see, this is our service area. Oftentimes people have said, well, where do you actually cover? What is your service area? I know that you have a coordinator in the east, the west, and the central. But what does that look like? And these are the counties that we work with. Um, we cover three-fourths percent of North Carolina. We have a small staff. It's just one of us. But there's lots of you. And so that's why working together, trying a new approach to increase donor designation rates. And instead of being everywhere, trying to do everything, um, it wasn't cutting it anymore. We still saw the DMV numbers. We still saw the registration rates. So we have to allocate these resources and we have to do something that's going to be reasonable and not something that we're just here, there, and everywhere. Um, so looking at that DMV data, concentrating on those cities, uh, concentrating on those 
those areas that we need to target to increase that 1% both overall designation rate and with African American community is going to be so important as we work through 2020. All right, so that was a huge list of counties, and that was counties, not cities. And you know, as Beth said, we are a small department. There are three of us, um, and that's a lot of places to try to be. And we have really kind of always tried to be all things to all people. And what we found that that kind of ended up with was us run ragged and not making a whole lot of impact because it wasn't focused. So we've decided to be focused. So what we did is we said, okay, what are the top 50 biggest cities in North Carolina? So we get this list, immediately we're able to eliminate some of these because they're not in our service area. We're knocking out Charlotte, we're knocking out Concord, we're knocking out some of these. Um, but then we looked at our DMV data. And we said, okay, of the most populous cities in the state, which ones have the lowest donor designation rate? Which ones are falling under that state average? And then it became very clear that there were certain areas that we can really concentrate our needs. For example, I have some towns in my service area that have incredibly low donor designation rates, but also incredibly small populations. So maybe that's not worth my time to go in those areas. So once we pulled all of our data together, this is what we came up with. These are the 15 areas we are going to be really, really concentrating in. If any of your eyes are lighting up because you live or know people in those areas, I encourage you, Judy, don't worry, I see you. Um, so these are our areas. All right, so now we're going to do a little bit of a breakdown of what the demographics are of these areas and how we chose them. We're not going to bore you a whole lot with this. Um, but one of the re regions I chose was Durham. Um, total population, it's one of the bigger cities in the area, um, and it has a pretty significant African American population. Um, it also has two DMVs. So in one DMV, and you can see there's, there's a, a decent uh, discrepancy between the two DMVs. In one DMV, um, we're at 49.2% total um, who say yes. In another one, we're only, uh, or excuse me, in the other one, we're at 53.1% who said yes. So within the same city, you still have this discrepancy, which is very interesting. Um, as you can see, 33.2% um, of African Americans said yes in um, one D DMV, and 35.2% uh, said yes in the other DMV. So this is sort of the, the data we looked at to kind of come up with our 15 uh, cities and really dive into those. With Garner, um, you can see we're at 52.6% you know, yes. So we've got a long way to go. If our state average is 56.3 and we're trying to get it up to 57.3 in a year, which let's be honest, today's the end of January, so we're talking 11 months, we got some work to do. Sanford, 53.5% said yes. Smithfield, hey, we got 55.5%, which is pretty exciting. Um, maybe we can really move that needle there. And then Fayetteville, which is pretty interesting because we actually have three DMVs there. Um, we've got a lot of work to do in Fayetteville. I mean, as you can see, we've got a DMV there that has only 46.5% registered. That's real, real far from where we're trying to go. Um, but then interestingly, we have one DMV in Fayetteville that has more than the state average. So this is the kind of data that we are pulling and looking at um, literally every day to kind of make decisions on you know, where we are and what we're doing. And some of you I know are used to the way we've been doing it for years, which is we're constantly inundating you with emails saying, hey, we're gonna be at this health fair on this day and this standard drive on this day and this Rotary Club on this day, what can you come to? Um, and they're all scattered all over the place. Um, we're taking a bit of a different approach now. We are being very strategic in the places that we're gonna be going. We're being very strategic in how can we make the biggest impact with a small staff and limited resources. And a lot of that will be coming down to you all. Um, in the east, you see we have Greenville and New Bern. Um, then we have some pretty interesting statistics. Uh, further east, the rates get a little bit lower. Um, Rocky Mount is in, in some pretty rough shape. So we're hoping that we can really move the needle, especially in that African-American community in Rocky Mount. I mean, they're not even at 30%. So that's, that's some pretty, uh, dire data we have at Rocky, in Rocky Mount. So hopefully with this concerted effort, we can really get in there and get more people registered. And kind of to follow through with Taylor, what she was talking about with the DMVs, um, 
This is how I identified the West, and you can see um, with Winston-Salem, uh, identifying the two offices, uh, we have the North and the South, the North being Patterson and the South being Silas Creek, and you can see the numbers, just like Taylor said. Um, you know, population, well, total number of licenses that are given out, and then you see the um, sign-up rates. Greensboro, they have two offices as well, and um, Market Street, and also we have one over there close to uh, the Coliseum and the rates that you see in the Greensboro. Now, interesting enough, I also pulled data um, just to look at what are in these areas. And so I saw that in Winston-Salem, uh, you know, we have the colleges. And we have five in the Winston-Salem area, colleges or um, community colleges that can be identified. And we have two large employers, the two hospitals, Baptist and Forsyth. And so, you know, looking also at that as well, Greensboro, the same thing, I looked at Greensboro. They too have five colleges and five community colleges that have been identified. Um, and a couple have, in Greensboro, the colleges are HBCUs, which is historically black colleges and universities. And so looking at the community, looking at the resources, how can we tap into that? How can we register more donors? Um, but just looking and saying, well, I think this area is low because, like Taylor mentioned, we're continually looking at the registration rates when people go to the DMV. Don't like to say it's the point of sale, but when you have someone who's renewing their license or getting their license for the first time and they're asked that question, do you want to be a donor? We want them to put a heart on their driver's license. And working to raise that African American rate is crucial. I also have Salisbury. Now, Salisbury and Thomasville, they don't have what, you know, Winston-Salem and Greensboro had, but they still have resources there in the community. Salisbury with two colleges and two hospitals. One's a VA hospital. But, um, you know, Thomasville, they don't have a university, but they do have a community college and one hospital. But looking at that DMV numbers is what we're trying to increase. You know, you saw 1% and a 1, and I think sometimes you think, oh, 1%, that's not a lot. But that's going to be huge for us in 2020 to move those numbers, to get people registered, to put the heart on their driver's license. And my last city is High Point. And there again, looking at the DMV data, looking at the license issued, and also looking at the community. And where are there ways that we can work together to raise awareness, to get people thinking, putting the heart on their license, and working within the populations, and especially in the African American communities where we want to raise those numbers. We want to get that, that information out there. All right. So, um, and one thing I meant to, meant to mention earlier, um, one of the reasons that we are looking specifically at the African American communities um, is that not only are those numbers lower than the numbers in the um, Caucasian communities, but they're also falling off every year. We are seeing a dramatic decrease each and every year in the percentage of African Americans who are registered donors. So that's why we're really singling that out and why when you say 1% increase, that may not seem huge, but we're trying to stop the hemorrhage. We've been decreasing more than 1% every year for about the past four years. Um, we need to not only stop that hemorrhaging, but also add to it another 1%. So, all of you are here today, hopefully because you are passionate advocates for donation. Um, and so what can you do? How can, we, how can we all work together? Well, I think the most important thing is that we look at this as not a, what are Beth Taylor and LaToya doing and how can we help them, but look at it as, we are a group, we are all in this together. And absolutely, sometimes we may ask you for help, but or you may ask us for help, but we're asking you for help. You guys are the eyes and ears. You are the backbone of meaningful contact in North Carolina. We are three people who live in three areas, and we do the best that we can to know what's going on, but we can only do so much. Also, we don't have those personal stories. So many wonderful points have been made today 
about how vital those stories are. And that is where you guys come in. That is where you can enrich our message. That is where you can come in and you can share your story. And that is so much more moving than me sitting up here spouting facts and figures. And so the big ask of the day, the action plan. How can we take what we've talked about today, the stories we've heard today, the and inspiration in this room that has gone on all day. I mean, this has been a great group, great discussions, great questions. How can we take that outside of this room and make an impact? Because as mentioned, the waiting list, the number of people who are waiting across the United States and right here in North Carolina, those are the people that we've got to every day do everything we can to save those lives. And with tissue donation, as people whose lives can be changed through healing with the many tissues that were mentioned today. So the action plan, some of the top things, just easy things we can leave here today, go home and work on immediately. Letter to the editor, your local paper, how important that can be. You guys have milestones, recipients, donor families that are sitting in here, even staff, hospital staff that may be here today and say, how can I connect? I mean, writing that letter of awareness, I'm hitting a milestone. I'm seeing my child graduate college. I didn't think I would be able to do it, but I'm celebrating X years with a transplant. How editors want those stories. They want those letters. They want to put, publish that. Another one. We need an army. We need so many more people in this room to help us with this mission. If you are part of a support group or if you have friends who have the same connection that you do with donation, whether it's recipient families, um, recipients themselves, donor family members, someone who's waiting, if you know someone, encourage them. Encourage them to join us. Become a Friends for Life ambassador to help us increase these numbers of uh, people registering. Go to your DMV, your local DMV, and just say thank you. Share your story with those examiners. Let them know the job that they're doing. Asking that one question to every customer, just how important that is. And something as easy as two visits a year. There are there are times in the year that we recognize organ donation, organ and tissue donation nationally. And make those visits then, around like April being Donate Life Month, or September and October where we see these national awarenesses and campaigns that go on. Make DMV visits. Um, crucial, Taylor mentioned earlier, the eyes and ears of your community. You may hear things that are going on health fairs, someone needing a presenter. Be the eyes and ears. Let's get information at those events, at those presentations. Sharing your story with anybody and everybody we can helps to get more people registered. As we talked about today, social media, just how important that can be. Just how many people read and get connected through social media. Um, and Probably the last one and the biggest one, and Taylor and I are very excited about this one because it is a big challenge. It is at the end of Donate Life Month, which we're all excited when it comes around as, as April 30th being the last day of April. But in front of you, did everybody receive an envelope, self-addressed stamped envelope? Open it up. There may be money in one of them for somebody. <laughs> Hurry up. Everybody see if there's money in there. Oh, it's in mine. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't find money in yours, talk to Chuck back there. I want to put it in the budget. Everybody get a Chuck. Raise your hand, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman in the back, there he is. Yeah. Gentlemen in the back there, you'll see these paper enrollment forms. Take these home. Everyone's talked about today to have conversations with your family. You have family members that are not registered. You have family members that you can talk to, what you learned today, what you were able to take away from this, this symposium today. Register five people 
by the end of April 30th. Something as simple as just filling out five of these forms. Mail them back to us. These forms will be entered into the online registry, state registry. And there again, the impact of one form, one person registering, how it can save and heal many lives. And we have more forms if you're so inspired. <laughs> yeah, you're not limited to five. <laughs> five is your minimum, not your maximum. And if they live in another state, then I would encourage them to go on their, um, on to register me. <laughs> there you go. On registerme.org and they can register there. And some of you guys um, that are in my area hosted a, a donor drive. Daryl and I did one at the local wild one day, and I think I registered three or four people. I mean, there are places that you just think, oh, nobody will want to hear this information or nobody will take the time to register. You just never know. Yeah. Is there a form we can put on, on our Facebook that they can download? To if register? There's a link. I mean, is the link on there? That if I put a story on there? To I register? And they can uh -huh. Yes. Because yeah. yeah. my kids were having a hard time at school. Yes. I had... 75 of them out with their phones yeah. and stupid things stalled. Yeah, we can, yeah, definitely. Okay, we'll fix that. Yeah, okay. So how do you do an event by yourself? And I know that sometimes that can seem really intimidating, um, but we're not talking about huge events. I'm not saying, you know what, every one of you in here needs to do a 500 person event by the end of the month or next month. That's not what we're saying. Events can be very small. You reach out to your church or your gym, um, like Beth mentioned, um, your Y's or gyms, places like that, are oftentimes willing to do things like blood drives, bone marrow drives. Guess what? They would probably also do a donor drive. Set up a table. It could be for an hour. It could be for two hours, maybe over lunch. And you go in there, you have supplies, you share your story, you register people. It's a really simple thing. I think a lot of times when we say host a donor drive, that sounds very intimidating, and it sounds like there's a lot to it. There's really not. So pick your pick the place where you're going to do your, your donor drive, and um, go ahead and get that signed up. And then what you do, and for some reason I'm not able to get this to pull up, of course, the website. But once you have your date and your location secured, in those lovely portfolios we gave you guys, you have printed screenshots of two websites. The first one is how you go on and fill out your um, event request form. So basically what that will do is will tell us where's your event, how many people are you expecting, we will send you all the supplies you need. If you need someone else to be there to help you, let us know, we can do that. Um, if you, you know, any questions, materials that you might have, you go in there, you fill it all out and you will get a lovely box full of supplies um, and maybe also a phone call from us if we, we want to talk more about it. Um, we'll send you everything that you need. We will get you set up with everything that you could possibly um, need for, to make that event a success. This is really, really important. After that event, you go online, back to our website, and you fill out your post-event wrap-up. Now, I know that just seems like more paperwork and a lot of extra, you know, like why do we have to go through all this? It's really short. It's really quick. But the reason this is important is, one, we can make sure that your event, we can find out, you know, oh, Oh my gosh, you know, Rodney registered 17 people at this event that he only expected 12 people to come to. That's amazing. Or, oh my gosh, you know, uh, Latanya decided to have an event. She thought there were going to be 400 people there. 12 showed up. Um, it helps us kind of know how much supplies to order, what places work, what don't work. Um, maybe somebody does an event somewhere where we're going, I, I can't imagine that's going to work. And it blows up and is a huge success. So please, please be sure and always fill those out. And last, something that we're very excited about here in North Carolina is the new legislation that passed last year, October 1st of 2019, the Heart Heroes Bill. And this to us was just finally, it had been in the making for so long and it finally was able to come Tuition. And so now, someone who goes into the DMV, puts a heart on their license after October 1st, 2019, is in the DMV registry as an organ eye and tissue donor. I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in a situation where you have someone come up to the table and they say, how do I register? And you say, first, put a heart on your driver's license, but that's only for organ and eye donation. And then they say, 
well, I just want to be a donor. I just want to donate everything. Is there something else I need to do? Yes, take this information on the online registry. You can register yourself to be an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Well, by this point, sometimes people look back at you and you think, I just probably lost them because I'm giving them so many steps and all they want to do is just register to be a donor. Thankfully now, as of October 1st, 2019, Heart Heroes Law, if you're 18 years or older, you put a heart on your license, you're in the DMV registry as an organ eye and tissue donor. So kudos to North Carolina. However, it's not retroactive. Yes, so if you so got your license on September 31st, 2019, you're still only a registered organ yeah. eye donor. So you do need to then either fill out the paper registration form or go online and fill that out should you want to register for tissue as well. Yeah. But as you see the last two bullet points, just how incredible these numbers are. You know, Sam talked about it earlier, the record number of tissue donors um, that we have seen the increase in tissue donation, 14% uh, increasing up to 24%. I mean, it's huge. It's huge, the numbers.